Welcome back, everybody, to the Investors Roundtable. I'm your host, Robert Kraft. You can follow me on Twitter, at Bobby K. Kraft. That's B-O-B-B-Y-K-K-R-A-F-T. And we have a very fascinating topic today to speak of, uh, and we're going to get right into it. Um, but first, joining me on this panel today, uh, we have one newcomer. It's first time on the Investors Roundtable, John Vandermosen. He is the Senior Biotech Analyst at Zach Small Cap Research. John, thank you for joining me today. How are you doing? My pleasure. Good to be good to be here and join in a different forum. Great to have you. No, this is a you're you're a key you're a key cog in the wheel today. We we need your <laughs> expertise for, for our topic. Uh, and then also joining us again, we got Stephen Keel from Arquitos Capital. What's up, Stephen? Our, our produ- I'm calling him our producer at this point. So what's up, Stephen? Uh, good to good to be here and uh, uh, good to be again here with uh, with Kevin and uh, nice to meet John for the first time. Very cool. Thanks, Stephen. All right. And with that, of course, we got Kevin Shea, Rack on Tour, at The Good Prick on Twitter. Uh, we still haven't hit the 500 yet. So if you haven't done so yet, go follow Kevin on Twitter. He will then soon do a TikTok uh, dance or something for us. But uh, yeah, he will. He don't, don't mind him. He's shaking his head now. He's going to do it for us. Don't worry about it. Uh, but Kevin, always, bla- always great having you on. How you doing? Good. Good to see you again, Steve. Yeah, welcome you on. TikTok might not exist by the time we get there, Kevin. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I, I at the good. end of the day, at the end of the day, I just wanted to get a video so that he gets picked up by a TikTok investors, you know. So I think <laughs> so. He, whether it's whether it's a dance, but or or just uh, something funny, financy, you know. I want I want that I want that profile to pick up on this video. But we digress. Yeah. We'll get. I, I, we'll we'll eventually get there. But uh, listen, today's topic. Um, really inspired by some uh, some pretty big news that we've seen out of the biotech industry. Um, it, I mean, if you've been living under a rock, you <laughs> that's the only way you probably don't know that, uh, you know, Pfizer has, uh, has gotten some pretty interesting results and some great results, really, on their recent trial for the COVID vaccine. And then the following week, Moderna followed up with their amazing results uh, on the COVID vaccine. We're not here to, to really get into each of those results individually. We can get into it if we want, but really the main topic today that we, we cover probably not enough, but it's something that's really important. That's really understanding the healthcare and life sciences industry as an investor. You know, how do you approach this industry? How do you look at individual companies? How do you understand clinical trials? You know, we're, we're, we're going through the whole gambit, you know, talking about experiences, you know, what we learned from that. So with that, I figured I'd throw it to our biotech expert on our panel today to really kick us off and give us kind of a, uh, a an overview and better understanding of, you know, what what investing in this sector really looks like in the context of some of these recent results that we've seen. So, John, I know that was a loaded question, so sure, feel free to sure. take as long or as little as possible, but kick us off and then we'll go from there. Yeah, I, I'm, you know, I mean, I guess, you know, when you think about just investing in general in in, in biotech, life sciences and things like that. I mean, there's the COVID investment, um, which, you know, may only be relatively few companies who get in there, but then there's the broader, you know, biotech investment. And as Kevin was mentioning earlier, it is, you know, it can be, it can be rather volatile and sometimes there are binary outcomes, but you can play in the large cap space and they have a large portfolio of drugs. You know, some are already revenue producing and uh, they have great distribution uh, and sales teams in place and they can actually pick up approved drugs that smaller companies uh, approve. So you can still get exposure uh, to the space and that's not uh, not so volatile and a little bit more secure if you play in the larger cap space. And then, you know, there's the mid cap space where they probably have some R&D and they also have some, um, you know, some, some uh, revenue generating uh, products. And then in the small cap space, you know, where we're kind of mostly focused that's, you know, that's where the real high risk, high return. I mean, you can get a 10 to 20 times payoff there. Uh, you know, in the coronavirus uh, era, we've seen a few, uh, a few names really spike up. Um, but I, I think, you know, one of the things that, that I've noticed anyway, is that it's the larger companies that have really kind of come out ahead. Um, you know, Pfizer, BioNTech, that, that combination there. Uh, because one of the big issues with this is the um, you know, distribution of the drug and also the manufacturing of, of the drug. Uh, you know, those are very uh, intensive processes. You need, you need uh, facilities and things like that. So that also kind of leans towards the larger players as well, uh, you know, for who are going to benefit the most. Um, you know, I'm, tr- I'm trying to think what else I can say about it kind of in the, in the COVID uh, universe. Uh, you know, one of the other things that, that 
coronavirus can do is help bring some technologies forward that may not have otherwise been advanced so quickly. Uh, and this mRNA, which uh, both um, uh, Moderna and Pfizer, uh, Pfizer, uh, Pfizer BioNTech, I should say, because they innovated it, um, it's uh, mRNA based. And, and one of the great things about that is that it actually can um, can use the body's own cells as kind of the manufacturing of the of the um, of the antigen, which uh, kicks off the body's immune response, right? So that really helps out in the manufacturing side because mRNA is relatively easier to manufacture than the flu vaccine, which you know, as probably most know, is chicken eggs and things like that. So um, you know, I just I know I've been throwing out some random things, but you know, these are kind of the 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 the, the big waves that are flowing through the industry and kind of what people are talking about. So yeah, hopefully that was helpful. That was, that was very helpful. Um, before, so I think to, to kind of pivot from there, because that, that, that was kind of a good overview. And, and this is a question for Steven and Kevin. You know, as, as you guys have made pretty evident, both in your individual interviews with me on the podcast and just in general being on, on here, you know, you, you guys tend to stay away from biotech, healthcare, more or less. Not, probably not fully, but more or less just because of some you know, you'll get into why in a second, but you know, what's been your experience thus far in your careers when you've been assessing biotech and healthcare and, and what, what's, what's been some of the source of the trepidation? So, uh, uh, you know, I'll go to Kevin first. He offline, uh, he, he had some good stuff going in. Sorry, Steve, we'll, we'll I'll come to you after. Yeah, Bobby, I think there's two or three uh, issues that I deal with on biotech and I mentioned them a number of different times in the past. Is one, I don't understand it. You know, the science is just done. I'm an engineer, in, you know, by, by, by background, but, um, and I understand engineering and science and mathematics and things of that type, but I don't understand the, the depth and, and, and discussion that goes on when someone's talking about a drug or drug discovery or things of that type. Um, even now, if you're looking at COVID, I mean, even the, even the pictures look kind of funny to me, you know, so there's a bit of, there's a bit of that. Um, the other part about it is with that, I, as, as was mentioned by John, um, there are, of the breadth of, of, of uh, opportunities. Um, and the one thing I think it comes down to is that we're talking about, about binary events. I mean, you can either make it or break it. Uh, and I think that happens regularly. You see it all the time. And at the other side is, um, the other part about it is that John mentioned is one of revenue. Um, these are all pre-revenue. Most of the small cap, micro cap are all pre-revenue. So you're in a situation where um, you, 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 your stock is moving based upon some news, okay? And even then, I don't. It's a phase one, phase two, or something going on. So it's kind of binary in that way as well. You, the stock moves on, on sentiment uh, more than anything else, in my opinion. So you know, if it's revenue generating, then I think it's a big difference. I think that there is a big opportunity to go out and look at revenue generating uh, companies, but they are in the large cap space. And the other opportunity as well is, is that if you really want to, you know, as as, you, as John was saying, get some exposure. You know, you may as well just buy an ETF, the IBB. You know, that way you basically, you basically, I think, should have um, a lot less risk associated with uh, 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 getting a, a single stock and hoping that that thing's going to succeed. Where the IBB is going to give you a general, general large particip participation in the much larger, broader market, and um, you know, it'll, it will, it will cover you from a standpoint of risk. So, as I said, I think, I think it's a binary problem. Um, I think the revenue is 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 really kind of um, uh, interesting here because how do you how do you value a company that hasn't got any revenue? Again, it's one of those situations, you know. And there may be ways to play it. And then, like, I think John might be able to discuss you know those opportunities as as you know where where is a where is a good place to participate and get some exposure um, if you're a skeptic or if you are indeed um, you know looking at it from a binary perspective. I mean, where's the Where's the alternative to participate rather than just going out and picking a, uh, picking a, picking a poke? Yeah. Hey. You know, one, one thing I, I point out is I was just looking at, you know, Biogen stock, when you talk about expectations and, and aducanumab, I don't know if any of you follow that pretty closely, but there was, there was speculation that it was going to do very, very well. Uh, and then a day or two later, it, it changed. And, and, you know, there was a 40% stock change in the stock. Uh, you know, for what a fifty billion dollar company, right? I, I mean, the, the the market cap changed pretty widely. But as you said, you know, sentiment can play a huge role uh, in this because, and you know, and the reason for that is because uh, you know you can charge so much for these drugs, and they'll have such a big impact uh, if they're successful, and no impact if they're not. Um, 
So, you know, that's, that's one thing I wanted to agree with you on that, you know, the sentiment can change things very, very quickly uh, without, you know, without any warning. What would you say about this idea? Oh, Stephen, go for it. No, no, I just uh, just wanted to, to kind of point out that it is pretty amazing, right? $10 billion swings kind of here and there based on kind of a news headline. <laughs> yeah, uh, exactly. <laughs> be, uh, be true. And it's, uh, it's, it's pretty fascinating, you know, uh, in, in kind of normal time, not, not, not that now is a normal time, but those things can happen uh, kind of in, in, in less volatile times as well. And, uh, you know, there are very few industries and companies and industries where that can happen. I think that does provide an opportunity for bottom up fundamental investors. And, but to Kevin's point though, you have to, you have to really have an expertise and know what you're doing. I mean, John, uh, I think can, uh, can, can measure, uh, you know, potential variables and outcomes uh, that can put a kind of a price range on a company that's maybe pre-revenue or uh, not generating profit at this point where, you know, someone like maybe Kevin and I uh, would have a hard time doing that just because we don't have the, uh, the specific kind of uh, scientific expertise to do so. Yeah, and I, I can talk for a second just on kind of the, the process that we use to come up with that, that valuation range. Um, you know, obviously the indication that, that a company is going into is, is really key. You know, is it a large indication? Is there an unmet need? Uh, will there or is there a lot of competition? What kind of pricing can they, can they get out of it? Um, you know, those are just some of the factors that you want to look at. How long will it take to get approved? Uh, you know, what we try to look for is, is large unmet needs, um, you know, and, and new, new innovative, uh, you know, products that uh, have shown early, early efficacy. And, you know, it's a probability, you know, I, I make that very clear in my research that it's all about a probability. And that's why the portfolio idea is so important. Um, you know, because if you get your probabilities right, you can be wrong on a 90% stock, but if you have, you know, 10 of those, one's gonna miss and nine are gonna make it, right? So that's that's kind of the, the, the thought process behind that. Well, I wanted to touch on this idea of binary events, because I mean, the, the one thing that's interesting, especially in the small micro nano cap space is that it seems like it's, you know, it's not just one binary event, you know, you can have a preclinical company that you invested in and it, you know, there's that binary event where those pre it was great. Now they're going to the phase one, you know, phase one, great. All right. Now going to phase two, eh, not so great. You know, so it's multiple events that could potentially happen that you just have to understand the timing of. So, I mean, can you speak to that a little bit more? Yeah, you know, I think I think that there are certain investors that focus on certain areas. You know, venture capital is probably one of the areas that um, uh, that focuses on the very early stage. Uh, some investors focus on early clinical trials, and then at phase two, a lot of times the costs to de develop beyond phase two uh, kind of take it out of the range of some of the smaller caps, and they look for partners, right? So that's that's kind of a a sale point. And then you know, phase three to approval is, is another one, um, and there, there's a lot. There are a lot of studies out there that show there's certain probabilities associated with uh, where you are in the development process. And of course, you really have to fine tune that by your own experience and, and the data and the specific data that's out there. Uh, but you know, that's that's kind of that's kind of how how that's set up. And then you know, obviously, as I said before, there's there's develop there's companies that you know the big the big companies, the big farmers, the big biotechs who only buy in on a sure thing and their their focus really is on distribution right the commercialization and things like that and that's you know less risky but uh you're not going to get the 10 times payoff probably that you would um from some of the smaller smaller guys that do have that binary outcome absolutely you know i wonder if is there a, a question for i think everyone and, and and bobby as well here uh is there a kind of a pickaxe shovel approach here that it might be a little bit less risky, uh, not risky, so to speak, but, but less kind of volatile uh, or unpredictable or have fewer variables. You know, John, when you have, um, you know, clearly there's, there's, you know, in the next few months, we're going to have significant production uh, of this COVID vaccine and uh, distribution and et cetera, et cetera, that will be kind of worldwide, maybe going on for years. Uh, who benefits, or do, you know, or are there any, any speculation as to who benefits uh, beyond specifically the biotech or the, the healthcare companies? You know, is there a pickaxe shovel beneficiary here? 
Uh, you know, I mean, distribution is obviously a big one. <laughs> Refrigerated trucks, maybe. <laughs> um, you know, I'm trying to think about what else it might be. You know, the, the supply chains are already pretty much in place, right, for this. Um, I, I was reading something about the Ebola vaccine that was taken into, into uh, Africa. And, you know, obviously they don't have the infrastructure there, uh, but some of their vaccines do require the cold chain requirements that, you know, Pfizer's drug would require. Um, so, you know, perhaps additional refrigeration, um, that, that seems say, like one area. I, I would say, ideas? yeah, I was thinking maybe like CROs or, or maybe, maybe not necessarily, well, yeah, probably CROs, uh, maybe biologics companies because they need the material to actually do the ah, testing. Vials, I heard I heard vials oh, were vials. hot, the little vials. Because <laughs> if we're doing a billion, we, I don't think we have that kind of infrastructure. Uh, I mean, I that kind of supply and space. That might be a good one. The, the, the glass vials and the syringes too. Because there's two uh, shots shot. for these uh, these guys. So. For, the, for the Pfizer drug, I think you hit the thing on the head when you talked about the cold chain, which is I'm quite familiar with. <clears throat> and um, you, you get into things like Cryoport. I think that's so it's, it's the cryogenic um, transportation company. Is that the name of the company? Cryoport. Yep. 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 Cryoport. I don't own it. Um, but it's quite funny because the thing that you saw immediately was the uh, the jump in Cryoport share price. Um, when the announcement was made for PFE. There are things I think like that. Um, uh, there are transportation companies that have to, have to um, the logistics of the, of the cold chain is pretty interesting. And what it requires, it requires monitoring. And uh, if you have temperature monitoring, the people who actually are the temperature monitoring uh, device sellers, the, IO, the IOT sellers will, will come out as a result of that as well. But that's strictly on, on PFE and it's not on the, on the broad market. Uh, Again, Moderna, which I don't own either. Uh, Moderna um, obviously came up with the with the uh, shelf shelf radio, whatever it's called. I'm not really quite sure, but it doesn't require any uh, temperature modification and any temperature controls. Um, the the interesting thing about it is though that almost all drugs are required to be managed under temperature because I think if they go through a, a one one C uh, variation in, in temperature control, uh, they're rejected. Uh, so the, the entire the entire cold chain <clears throat> is being monitored. So how that fits in <clears throat> broadly, um, even though it's called the cold chain, um, the the temperature monitoring has to be done for all drugs. Then the is the feds have a have a law out I forget the name of it uh, that requires it to be to be uh, done throughout the entire uh, supply chain. That that's a pretty interesting deal. And I agree with you, Bobby, about the CROs. Um, uh, there are different types of CROs and different types of um, companies doing work. You know, we, we're familiar with one. It's called uh, Immune Precise. It's heavily um, uh, managed in, in the microcap club space. And that uh, they are producing uh, uh, antibodies. So that their, their deal is to, is to be the picks and shovels for, <clears throat> they also are a CRO. They, um, they, they will be the picks and shovels, but they will be producing and manufacturing uh, antibodies. Uh, which will be used by the larger companies to um, uh, to produce the drugs, manufacture the drugs that they're that, that they're um, that they're going to be producing. So, yeah, I think the picks and shovels are there, Stephen. Um, and if we think about them, they'll be probably even more. Yeah, and Kevin, real quick, are you a shareholder in uh, Immunoprecise? I I have a small position, yes. Gotcha. And also, can you can you what what's a lar? Oh, is a, did you mean a law or lar? I, I, that's a Bostonian. Shut your oh, mouth. Oh, oh, okay. All right. Law. A, I think it was okay. called DCSCA, something like that. I'll find out what it is for you in a minute. I got it out at Harvard Yard with Noma was playing. Noma, Noma played in Harvard. <laughs> so, you know, John, though, I, I, I do have a question, I, you know, and I'll just be kind of full of questions this morning, I think, or today. Um, you know, where are the margins on, uh, you know, I, I, you would think, um, as a, a, a lay person, so to speak, as, uh, coming from my perspective, uh, you know, you have uh, a couple companies that have, um, you know, seem seem to have products that could come to market to address this. What can they charge? Mm -hmm. What are the the margins there, and how does it justify the changes in their stock prices? Yeah. Right. You know, vaccines are generally seen as a low margin business. I mean, can, any kind of preventative type medicine is is pretty much uh, low margin, um, you know, but that's kind of offset by uh, success rates for vaccines and getting approved. Right. Uh, they, they get approved at a much higher rate than, you know, cancer drugs, for example. Uh, so it kind of 
balances out a little bit. But, you know, I know that some companies, uh, some of the larger guys have tried to back off of vaccines, you know, because it's generally not seen as, as profitable as some of the other areas. Because, you know, you have worldwide distribution in the United States, you have the ability to pay uh, in, in, in some of the other, uh, you know, developing countries where it's sometimes the vaccines are needed even more acutely than here. Uh, they don't have the ability to pay. So, you know, a lot of times the margins aren't really as attractive as, as you'd hope. Um, I think the thing on coronavirus is, is the volume, right? You make it up in volume. Um, I, I don't know if I should say this or not, but I think I saw $10 was the price of the vaccine at one, one of them that was agreed with the government. And they may be providing, uh, well, I mean, also the governments, you know, EU and the United States have also provided some upfront funding as well, which offsets the development cost, right? So when you think about it throughout the whole, the whole cycle, um, you know, $10 for a vaccine, and I need to I need to verify that I, I think I just saw it somewhere, uh, um, but I'm not exactly sure where. Uh, you know, maybe you could make 20, 30 percent margin on that. Um, but for some of the other drugs, the margins are you know upwards of 90 percent, right? At least the gross margins anyway. So uh, yeah, vaccines aren't the most profitable uh, profitable part of of the you know the drug um, paradigm, but uh, yeah. Uh, They'll make it up on volume, I guess, right? Would, a, would the flu vaccine be kind of a comparable here? What are the margins generally? Do we know? Uh, well, you know, just based on what I know about um, uh, development and, and manufacturing, mRNA vaccines are going to be cheaper just because you don't have to incubate them like you do with uh, the flu vaccine and the, and the eggs and things like that. So it's going to be cheaper to make them. Uh, you know, the body is actually doing the work of making the antigen, the protein. Uh, so uh, that's one factor that'll play in, in favor there. Uh, but they are, you know, they're biologics and biologics are usually um, more complex than, uh, well, I, I guess I would say almost always more complex than, you know, like a pill or something like that. Um, there is actually one company that's working on a, um, a coronavirus pill. And let me see, I don't think they're in the clinic yet. I, I made a note of them. Uh, what was their name? I'm looking here in my notes. Uh, Vaxart. Yeah, they're working on an oral recombinant vaccine, um, you know, which actually solves a few problems. Uh, you know, one being that it doesn't have to be refrigerated like, uh, like some of the other drugs do. And then, and then number two, it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's oral, it's easier to administer. And, and John, real quick, are you a shareholder and or uh, are they not, or uh, a client of, of Zax? Neither a client nor a shareholder of, of Vaxart. Perfect. Hey, John, real quick, just just going right to the Moderna and, and Pfizer uh, trials. I mean, is there anything about those trials, despite them being very successful? Is there anything that we should be concerned about? I mean, look, mm. you know, we're yeah. pushing this through, which we want to see pushed through. We want to get the vaccines. We want to get this done. But I mean, you know, I think there were only 100 person trials each one. Uh, well, maybe maybe a actually, little bit more, but but what, what, what are some things that we should understand about this? Yeah, yeah, let me help you under, help everyone understand that. So actually the trials are very, very large. Uh, 60,000 people, I think, for Pfizer. But you were kind of right in what you were back. saying. I'll get, I'll get to that. Um, <laughs> okay. But I think only 95 people, they base their, their, um, their success rates on, on a very small number of people, though. I think there were eight people that, that caught it in the, in the, in the right. active the arm, and then there were like 95 or something in the, in the um in the, in the placebo arm, right? Then, right, uh, right? So they calculated that off. And, you know, there's a few things you have to think about. And I've been thinking about this too. I mean, how long does it take the vaccine to take effect, right? How long until you can get immunity? I mean, is it a week? Is it, you know, is it a couple of days? You know, your body has to build up the, uh, the antibody, um, uh, the antibodies. And, you know, it takes, it takes people about two weeks to get over the flu. So, you know, maybe it takes about a week for you to build those antibodies. Uh, so that's one thing to worry about. And then a number two item to think about is how long is this immunity gonna last? I mean, it could only last a very short period. There have been some one-off stories about people catching it again. Uh, I don't think those are very frequent. I mean, every time we, we, we see one, you know, it's, it's reported extensively. So maybe we're uh, giving that a little bit too much weight, but we do need to know how long this lasts. You know, is it gonna last, um, a year or, or a couple of years or you know just a few months so that's another thing um let's see i, I may actually made a few notes you know side effects we don't know about long-term side effects there's this big story uh from the 1970s i think when when we had the last uh, kind of push to get something out there really quick and there were some I, there were some issues and neurological side effects and things like that that weren't seen until you were in large populations so that's another thing that we have to see um 
you know, so, so there's a lot, you know, that's, that's why normally trials, uh, the trial uh, development process takes, uh, you know, five years sometimes because there's all these smaller issues that are out there. But obviously when we have a really huge pandemic like this and it's affecting us so deeply, we, we have to kind of, I don't know if I should say cut corners, but, you know, go a little more quickly and kind of balance our risks. I guess that would be the better way to say it. We have to balance our risks a little bit better. Right. Well, I'm afraid uh, Bobby Bobby can be the canary in the coal mine here in the area where he lives in when we'll see what the effect these anti-vaxxers have, uh, if there's any sort of kind of it's repercussion. You too. You're in, you're in New York, man. Yeah, yeah New, but York, not, New York and LA. Nutty out here is. <laughs> yeah, I'm for, I mean, yeah. Yeah, that, that's a whole other set of issues, you know, even once everything has been signed off. But when you, but off, when you think just, yeah, there's when that anti Yeah, second, third order effects of something like this, you know, when you rush something through for approval, legitimately so, uh, to, to address this, um, you know, there certainly could be uh, some, some effects that don't show up until the future. I mean, we still don't even know right now uh, if there are long-term effects you know, from COVID that might not show up for, or that might never go away or might not show up for several years. And uh, so, you know, you, you hate for their, we have to do this, of course, but there is a second or third order potentially effect that, uh, you know, could, could cast doubt on, on a lot of vaccines, you know, if there's something legitimate there that uh, some of these, some of these people um, uh, who are already skeptical uh, are unable to do the math on the cost to benefit analysis there. Yeah, it's definitely a balancing of risks on, on all sides. Let me let me jump back in again because I went out and I did some little uh, research quickly to Stephen's question about picks and shovels and the uh, the cold chain. It's uh, under the Drug Supply Chain Security Act, uh, and that's required of all men all large manufacturers to control their logistics. Uh, so any of the cold chain related activities um, are, are uh, under governmental regulations. So DSCSA, Drug Security Chain, Drug Supply Chain Security Act, for what it's worth. And then, well, you know, there's the distributors, uh, you know, like Cardinal Health or Marisol's Bergen or, um, you know, some of the others that they, they, you know, they're, they're, they're pretty involved in that. And there might be actually, you know, there might be even some foreign names that, that will get some extra action as well. Uh, I don't know those, but that might be a good a good place to look. Um, because yeah, that's, I think uh, those are those are the names that I'm familiar with. Um, and not only that, there are they they inter they include um, packaging. So the packaging is also part of the picks and shovels. I'm <laughs> familiar with. Uh, I think it's called World Carrier. They're part of Amerisource Bergen, and they pro they produce these very large. Let's just call them like, like Yeti coolers. Is about what they are like. But they're big. Um, yeah. They go from Yeti, they go from, you know, from garage size, not garage size, but small shed size uh, containers to the stuff that you ship, um, you know, like dry ice in. So that there's, there's quite a bit of activity going on in, in that realm um, that might very well, you know, be interesting to some people. What about, what about uh, medical waste collection? If we have a lot of syringes and a lot of vials here is a stericycle or something along those lines, uh, you know, going going to benefit the medical waste area. It's a good question. I think they burn it a lot, don't they? Well, they're trying sure. to burn it. <laughs> do, should we go short the environment then? <laughs> yeah. God. There's a few reasons to do that, isn't there? <laughs> Is it, do we have a, a an environmentally friendly syringe company out there that we can call on to? you know, deliver all the vaccines, that would be nice. Well, let's see how Stericycle stock has done the last uh, couple of days here to see if, you know, uh, let's see, down today, but uh, you get, give, me a, give me a quick minute here over the last five days. This is that point in the round table where we all check our computers at every stock that <laughs> yeah. we've talked about to see yeah. if, uh, to see what's been going on. But if that's any indication of the healthcare and life sciences sector. It changes that, quickly, that, right? That should well, you be know, it what, right there. <laughs> One, one interesting thing that I came across when I was when I was reading through some materials yesterday is this new company uh, that I just heard of, Lucera. Uh, they had their all-in-one test. It's an at-home uh, test, yeah. uh, molecular test for for COVID, and it and it seemed like it was pretty pretty good. I think ninety four percent positive uh, when compared against PCR, but it was a really small sample size. They only they only tested fifty one or they, only fifty one people uh, determined that that number. 
but uh, um, yeah, it, uh, it, it that seems interesting because you see all these long lines of cars, you know, waiting to get these tests and, you know, the turnaround time has been terrible. That's one of the things I've really heard about a lot is that, you know, if it takes five days to get your results back, it's kind of useless because you may, I mean, you, you need another test, right? If you're going to go uh, be around people. So uh, this, this at-home test, it takes 30 minutes. Uh, again, it's Lucera. And just to respond to your, your question, I even asked me, we don't know it. And I hadn't even heard of it before um, a day or two ago, but uh yeah, it detects COVID RNA. So kind of an interesting thing. And they, they actually raised something like, th I think $35 million in February, probably by chance, right? Because nobody really knew kind of where this was going and it takes a few months to get that prep. So they were quite lucky and they were developing a, like a flu test or something. And they decided to change direction, obviously. And uh, it, it got emergency use authorization just, uh, just like a day or so ago. So interesting. John, I, I saw that as well. I saw that yeah. as well. And I, there are other companies that are doing more or less the same thing and kind of relegated to the pregnancy test type of domain. Mm. The thing yeah. that's like, so <clears throat> that's kind of funny because one of the things that I, I did do some research on after coming across another company that uh, did another home an in-home test. Um, <clears throat> and I started looking at companies that, the companies that make the little device that is used for the pregnancy test, you know, those little, the little handheld thing to see whether or not there might be a, a picks and shovels play there as well, you know, to sit down and see, well, who's going to be producing these things and who's going to be manufacturing them. So if this, what would you say was Lucerna, something like that? Yeah, Lucera, L-U-C-I-R-A. So they may, they may be a biological company, but they probably can't produce anything. They, they have, they're not, they probably haven't got any manufacturing, any distribution or anything of that stuff we talked right. about. Right. Yeah. They're probably one of those virtual companies. They outsource all of the manufacturing there. So the question you have is it. how are they going to, how are they going to execute it? Do you, you know, do you, do you spit into the device or no, do you shove the device up your nose or some yeah. stupid thing, mm -hmm. you know, <clears throat> how are you doing? Poke your head up, you know, so, <laughs> uh, you know, give yourself a, you know, an aneurysm. Uh, so the, the question I had is that if, how are they going to manufacture these things? And if so, you know, there's already people that are out there producing something similar to it. If you can, if one could suggest that pregnancy test is similar in some fashion, um, but it's an in-home test. You know, you do something with it, you, you spit on it, or I don't want to say you pee on it, but you, you know, spit on it or something. You know, <clears throat> so now, there are again lots of picks and shovel stuff that's out there. Yeah. What, so the other thing that my question is: We're talking about healthcare and life sciences. We are we are indeed sticking to drugs, right? Is that the uh, is that the basic? Hey, we can, can talk, we we can get into med tech. We can get a, to medical device if you want, Kevin. I know you got some experience there. Yeah, I didn't so know whether John was strictly on on on. Let's just call. Uh, it yeah, I'm mostly focused on on biotech and, and pharmaceuticals. But you know, I can I can I can branch out a little. If I don't know, I'll let you know. I'll let <laughs> yeah. Stephen take it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, hey, John, real quick, before we maybe pivot to that, just in case, I, I have a dumb question that I don't think I've ever asked you before. And I can't believe I haven't, but I'm going to ask you now. How do they determine the size of the trials? You know, how, how do you determine that for, for Pfizer, you know, that uh, they do 60,000, but they're only going to pick from the 100 or, you know, with Lucera, yeah. the, the 51. And that's, that's going to determine, you know, so many huge outcomes and, you know, next steps and how much money you might be able to raise for the, like, how do you, how do you get to some of these? Yeah. Right. Nebulous I mean, numbers? So there, there are statistical, I mean, you have, to, it's very deeply statistical and it depends on volatility of results or standard deviation of results, right? You want to be able to get that, that P value or that statistical value that shows you're highly right. confident that there's like a one in a hundred or one in a thousand percent chance, mm -hmm. or I mean, a one in a thousand chance that you're wrong, right? So there's a lot of work that goes on in the background. And, you know, I used to be into statistics, but I've forgotten it all now, but I do know that yeah, the yeah. concept is that you kind of you look at previous trials and and kind of how they turned out and and the, and the volatility of the results you got in them. Uh, I think I read that for um, for Pfizer's or or um, or for uh, Moderna's, they actually looked at the previous SARS and looked at that volatility of that to determine their their size, right? Because they just didn't have enough information in such a short time. So that was what drove it. And they probably added an extra layer of you know protection on there. Um, but that's, you know, that's how they do it. And some like, like this one for Lucera, I don't think that, I mean, 51 does not sound like a, 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 an inspiring number of, of tests, you know, for me to have confidence in, in that 94% number they gave, but um, you know, they can do more. Uh, and then also, you know, you also, if you're looking at it, you want to see that P value and a P value of one just means 
you're you're ninety nine percent confident that uh, you know the results are. Um, or there's a one in a hundred chance that it's wrong, right? It's, uh, the, the data don't always play that out because a lot of times you'll see those low P values in, in a phase two and then you get to a phase three and it fails. So I think sometimes they may overstate, uh, it just depends on how you're asking the question. But yeah, that's that's a good question to ask on how, how they um, how they determine the trial sizes. Lies, damn lies and, and statistics. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating situation because, you know, it is, you, you hit it on, I, I know that for certain that it's all based upon statistics, that they can't get enough people, okay? And they can't get enough people fast enough, which is the other part about it as well. If I follow the whole thing, I mean, there aren't enough sick people who mm-hmm. might benefit by, by a cure that they can get all those sick people in the room at one time. So it's going to last sure. years in order to build up the, to build up, I forget what the word is that they use, but to build up the the, 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 um, the number of people. Yeah, the data set, just build up the data, data set. set. Yeah. yeah, you just, just well, can't get people. And then sometimes yeah. the people aren't the right people, you know, so that there are all, there are all kinds of different variabilities that come into play when you're looking at these statistics. Right. Um, and again, yeah. uh, th- those are some of the things that I think are pretty fascinating is trying to use AI Again, if you fly hmm. damn lies and statistics and artificial intelligence. And then there's AI. <laughs> and then there's AI, which just confuses it even more. Um, but I think that there are some benefits that, that come in when you start looking at uh, AI, because you can start and look at past data um, yeah. and see how that all came out. But again, you have to go back and it's, it's I, 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 I full well believe you. And that's the other part about it is the word, why I'm a skeptic is because it's based upon statistics. Okay. Yeah. Um, and you, if you're if you're a statistician, if you if that's what you were implying, that's I mean that's a that's a funny business to be in. I mean you're really kind of out there. You said probabilities earlier, and I kind of smirk at that too. Um, but I'm, I think that the idea of using statistics to to uh, well, every everything is uncertain. Well, well, Kevin, you brought up an interesting point that that I think you know we, we should address is that there's certain groups, uh, and I didn't bring this up before, but there's certain groups that are more susceptible to uh, the the COVID than others. Uh, you know, obviously we know that older older individuals, 65 and up, they have a much higher rate. Uh, if you have a, a um, you know comorbidities such as obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, things like that, those are also going to increase your rate. Uh, men are more susceptible than women, um, uh, so that's another issue. So when you're doing these trials, you also have to make sure that you're you're capturing all of these different groups in there. And then you know there's there's differences by race as well. Um, you know, that's a big thing because, you know, your genetic makeup determines, uh, determines a lot of times how you respond to a different virus. And, and then there was, a, there was something that I read about different blood types have different susceptibilities to, to COVID as well. I'm sure we've all seen that. I've seen several articles on that. Uh, so that's, you know, that's one way you can also play AI. Uh, and that might be another, you know, another pick and shovel type thing. Uh, to apply to this, you know, find out which populations. I, I was just looking at, uh, I was trying to summarize how many phase three drugs there are or how many phase three vaccines. I think I have like at least 10 or 11 or 12 uh, that are in that stage right now. And, you know, some some might be better for some people and some might be better for others. And if you can match them up, uh, you know, you're going to you're gonna be a lot more effective in, in uh, you know, preventing the, vi- or preventing the, 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 um, the, the virus and also, you um, uh, you know, saving saving money and distribution and things like that. Because why give somebody a, a, a vaccine that's not going to work on them? Right. And I think that's a lot. Of, if you go back and look at the politics of, of vaccines, you know, talk about anti-vaxxers. Um, th- th- I think those are the people who actually may have studied and find out that there are side effects that are unknown. There are a number of different things that are based upon statistics. So I think when you go back and look at um, at uh, those who who view vaccines as being uh, not not the best thing in the world to have. <clears throat> um, might very well be looking at these things more scientifically than than others. So again, I'm not I'm not projecting vaccines, anti-vaccines. I don't really care per se, but I think that there are some interesting things out there. Um, one of the things that's really quite fascinating to me is, is is the actual benefits of AI in a broader fashion in healthcare. Um, I'm familiar with a company which I do not own. It's called ICAD. Um, they are they are a, a, a breast cancer detection company and mammography company, and they have they have uh, implemented uh, <clears throat> AI for uh, helping a radiologist determine whether or not uh, there are uh, uh, bad cells in, in breasts. And what they have found, if I, the numbers are something to the effect of radiologists by themselves will be uh, 84% uh, of, the, of their, of their um, uh, reading, readings will come out positive, will, will be good. Um, adding on AI, they get, to, they get into like mid 90s. So again, uh, um, when, you can, when you can support 
um, scientists with more and more and more data, I think there's a value in it, and it's. It, it, I think it is becoming <clears throat> more pre more prominent and more prevalent. So um, again, picks and shovels when looking at uh, AI and AI related activities, and these things may very well be out in the periphery, uh, <clears throat> you know, and that's CROs and, and companies like that who may have expertise in those areas. Right. You know, one point I'll make about AI, and I actually did a panel on this a couple of weeks ago, and it's not it's not actually the 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 software. It's not the uh, you know it's not the computing power that really makes a difference. It's actually the, the availability of the correct data, the curated data, right? And and the people behind it that are putting it together. I mean, anyone who's done statistics knows when you put together linear regression model, you know what you include there is very important, right? So and and basically AI is just you know statistics itself. That's the way it works. But getting the right data and making sure that you have the correct curated data. Uh, is also so very important. And that's the hard part, right? You know, I mean, if we if we had everybody's genome, a lot of this would be a lot easier, but it's just not something that's, you know, there's a, a central database for all that. Very good. Steven, you had a question? No, I just wanted to, you know, you take a half step back kind of based on this discussion and show how amazing is this? You know, it we have uh, this outbreak really reached the U.S. and in, in, to, to a degree, to a, a large degree in mid-March. And here we are mid-November and we have kind of preventative measures. And, you know, when you think about the history of the world and the arc of advancement and progress where, you know, thousands of years there were no vaccines <laughs> and no treatments for serious, uh, for some serious diseases and things like that. And here we have, you know, in, you know, six, seven, eight months, uh, we have something that can prevent, um, you know, widespread, you know, kind of spreading and sharing and things of this, of this nature. So it is pretty amazing. And, you know, whether it's all of these advancements we made, the AI stuff, the statistical analysis, the, the foundation of drugs we're building upon, all of that research and analysis and the spreading of information in a positive way uh, is really, really quite amazing and wondersome. And it, it always kind of reminds me, and, and you know, this is human nature too, how we get so used to these things that it's just expected. It's been six months. Why don't we have a vaccine yet? You know, <laughs> and it's kind of like the old antidote about you're flying on a plane today and the, the internet is a little bit slow and you're so upset about it, you know, and you forget to take a half step back and realize the wonder you're in flight, you're communicating, you know, with everyone, anyone in the world, with all of the information in the history of the world at your fingertips, and it's a little bit slower than you were expecting, and you're upset about that. And we had none of this 100 years ago, <laughs> you know. It's so it's it's really amazing, and I think uh, uh, you, you just have to give a lot of credit to human ingenuity here, and <laughs> to bet on uh, continued advancements in ingenuity. Well, it's it's pretty amazing. Hey, amen to that. I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. Here we, here we are. You know, the, the thing when I taking that even uh, another step further, when I, when I think about where we were in March and how we're now finally at, at, you know, what looks like hope, you know, with, with, with these results out there is you start thinking about other, um, other indications, you know, not just vaccines, but other, um, other, you know, cancers out yeah, there. Neurodegenerative and, disease. That's a big yeah, one. Yeah. All these deaths. Yeah. yeah, it's just it, you you start thinking about, you know, I mean, could we move faster to start getting either preventatives or or even cures, you know, if if there was this much of a widespread um pandemic even in in those in, in other indications in those cancers, you know, I mean, even though there there are millions of people that are affected with it, it doesn't get the same kind of, you know, um attention as a, as I mean, rightfully so. Look, we ever a lot of people are getting sick and very quickly in this wide, very widespread. But, but still, you know, when you think about breast cancers and, and ovarian cancers and 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 how many women that affects on a, you know, on a yearly basis, you know, you just want to see some of these other things moving a lot faster. And ah, uh, just John, how how yeah, do we get this happening faster? There's no there's no change without a crisis, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, maybe some of the, the accelerated pathways and, you know, the FDA adapting to, to this will, you know, enlighten people on how to do that in other important areas. I mean, you know, one huge area that I always try to bring up is neurodegenerative disease, like Alzheimer's disease and things like that, where there's no, there's no therapeutic there that really works. I mean, there's a few drugs out there that help delay the symptoms, but 
nothing that works. And with aducanumab, you know, kind of looking like it's not going to go anywhere. Uh, there's really nothing out there that's in the late stages that might be available in the next few years. Even, you know, even if there is something successful, it won't be out there for a few years. So, yeah, and that's a huge, huge issue. I mean, I think, you know, like 30 million people are expected to, to suffer from that in the next few years, or, you know, in, uh, in the next several years. Uh, so that's, that's a huge, uh, you know, huge population. So perhaps, you know, we can take some of the lessons we've learned from this and, and apply it to other areas like that. Yeah, one of the things we've discussed in the past, <clears throat> which I promote, is this thing called the innovation cycle. And I think what you're asking, Bobby, is is uh, are noting both you and Stephen, is that the innovation cycle is sped up dramatically. <clears throat> you know, our expectations for cures is, is uh, right out there, and it's probably not a bad thing to recognize that more and more and more people focus more and more time on some of these things. Is that the innovation and the collective minds of these very smart people? Uh, will indeed drive cures and drive um, major events that will, that will ultimately come, in my opinion. Um, it's fascinating to see that the innovation cycle has indeed entered the biological space. You know, it, I mean, again, if you look at computers and semiconductors and things of that type, there was a huge innovation cycle over 20, 30 years. Um, go back to the industrial age and things of that type. But I think you might very well be in a, in a biological innovation stage we're probably still at the early portion of it. Um, and I think that if you go back and look over time, you can see how innovation cycles actually develop um, and, and deployment, of course, deployment cycles at the same time. So I think there may be some interesting, uh, I don't know, philosophical perspectives of uh, how innovation uh, might be introduced or change, uh, how innovation might be, um, as you said, kickstarted again with change because the, this crisis is creating it certainly will create changes in the FDA, in my opinion. I mean, it's also Let's creating so. changes in the way the hospitals uh, introduce things. I mean, the, the, the hospitals are already uh, undertaking process change dramatically um, to the point where you're going to go, I think you're going to see uh, operations at the hospitals quite different. You know, I was talking with my wife, she just went in for a mammogram, and everything has changed uh, when she walked in there. It's, never, it's, not, it's not the same as it used to be. In my opinion, it's not going to be the same from there on in. Um, because uh, they recognize that uh, they have to uh, maintain this, this uh, separation, uh, but the separation actually sped up the process. So they kind of got there by, by mistake in a, in, a, in a way, but that's part of innovation as well. So I think it's quite interesting how the whole thing is going to come up. And, and the, even these small examples of how, how women are, are being treated in, in mammogram uh, um, spaces, is, is just fascinating to me. I mean, those are the day-to-day -day things that will ultimately change and benefit people and things of that type. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you know, you just made me think of telehealth and, and how that's really taken off and, you know, that whole that whole space there. Um, you know, I know my 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 annual checkup was was on uh, on the on the video screen last time. So, you know, I'm sure I'm sure a lot of other people are doing that too. I don't know if that improves the the outcomes, but it certainly makes uh, you know it helps that industry advance forward, which had kind of been moving a little bit slowly. Uh, and there's you know there's actually you make me think of a lot of different uh, companies that are focused on on areas like uh, there there was one company that that I used to cover uh, called Vivas. They're actually private now. Uh, but they they were working on uh, obesity treatment, and a lot of individuals who are obese are are hesitant to go into in person visits just because they're a little bit ashamed, perhaps. Uh, and and it, you know, based on their research, they found that 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 individuals were more interested in in uh, doing it online, right? So now now that that's kind of seen to be more acceptable, and 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 there's more infrastructure in place uh, to do it. That, that could be another area that, uh, you know, could grow pretty substantially in coming years. You know, I've, I have a random healthcare policy question. It was kind of, it was inspired by something that Kevin said, we're, we're in this innovation cycle and, and, you know, I'm hoping to see some changes at the FDA, you know, but I mean, has, has the, the process of getting a vaccine or drug over the finish line, getting that FDA, that coveted FDA approval, you know, that 15, 20 year cycle, that coveted thing, you know, is, is there a potential where let's say they cut a little bit of the red tape or, or they make it, I don't want to say necessarily easier, but the process is just mm. done a lot. It, it's just, it, there's just a better process put in place. I mean, could that also eventually have effect on so many other things when we think about 
some of these companies, maybe even just drug prices in general. I feel like part of the reason drug prices are so high because these companies take so friggin' long to get, to get yeah. them across, you know, I mean, right. it has to be economic at a certain point. So, I mean, I, I could totally be wrong and please call me out. Yeah, actually, you know, concerned. that's a point that I, I think is important and I, actually I'd like to respond to it. Uh, I think one of the issues is the FDA doesn't get enough funding. Uh, I was just reading something that the, the number of, of, of complete response letters, which basically means your drugs failed for now. Uh, it may come back later, but uh, that that number is way up. And the FDA has just been distracted with COVID. Uh, one one of my companies uh, they had their 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 uh, approval date pushed back by at least three months. You know they're still waiting on it. I don't think the FDA has enough uh, people and resources to do what it's supposed to do, or they've been reallocated because you know when a company submits, they actually pay the FDA to to approve um, to to review it, right? Um, and, and sometimes I think the FDA doesn't care enough about, uh, and, and this may be because of resource constraints, but they don't, they don't, they're, they're not, they're not seeing kind of the other side of this, which is you know money is just kind of bleeding away while they're taking their time, and patients are dying uh, when there's these you know these treatments out there that 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 could could help them, uh, and, and I, you know I don't sometimes I don't think the uh, the incentive is there uh, properly for the FDA to approve because I, I I get the sense a lot of times that they just you know, if it takes longer, well, that's all right. But, you know, meanwhile, this company is burning through, you know, a million dollars of cash a month or whatever it is. And, you know, a lot of investors are saying, you know, well, why do I want to put my money in this, you know, burning through a million dollars? So I would say that the incentives, maybe they could be modified somewhat to get the FDA uh, more aligned with, you know, kind of the, the greater good, right? I mean, what um, but more I, incentives but I do, do they need got to more save resources, people? That would help. No. Oh, I'm sorry. What was that about? I, I was going to say, like, what more incentives does the FDA need? We got to let's save people, you know, like, yeah, no, I, I just <laughs> my observation, you know, I mean, obviously, no, I'm no, not no, you're there. right. It, I, I, it's a lot more complicated probably than I, than I can see, but um, it does take a long time and, and yeah. every, you know, for every month delay, you know, that's, that's a lot of people that could be helped or saved or anything like that. So okay. Can you speak? Can you speak at all to uh, compare at all the FDA to the ways in which, for example, Germany works? My understanding that Germany is much more progressive with regard to um, um, authorizing or approving various devices. Certainly, medical devices. I'm familiar with that. I just mm. didn't know whether or not there are international uh, comparisons that can be made from the FDA that they actually proceed well ahead of everybody else. Do you, are you familiar with mm. all? Yeah, I mean, you know, the EMA, I mean, there's a few ways you can get approved in Europe. I mean, usually the EMA, which is the EU, now X, the UK, right, because they're gone now. But they, a, a lot of drugs would be approved by that, you know, the, the EU, uh, the EMA, European Medicines Agency. Uh, drugs can also be approved on a country by country basis. Um, based on what I know about the timelines, it's a little bit different than the FDA, but it's about the same amount of time. There's a, the one thing I, I, I point out about the EMA process is there's a break in the middle where they kind of hand everything back to you and they give you questions. And then, you know, it's kind of, the clock stops, right? And it's back on you to do it as fast as possible and then return it to them uh, with, with all of their questions answered. And then they'll take another so many days and then, and then respond. But, you know, it takes about a year usually for something that comes through to get approved, but there's a lot of other meetings too. And, and I am not an expert on all the in and out details in terms of, you know, what the EMA is doing, but, you know, as a company goes through phase one, two, and three, they're always touching base with the FDA to make sure this trials are constructed um, in a way that, that shows what, uh, you know, that shows efficacy and safety and, and make sure you're getting the right endpoints, right? You wanna make sure you're measuring the right things so that when it does get approved, it's, it's something that's useful, right? Um, and then there's also what's called the end of phase two meeting. And that's, that's what you go into right before you develop your, your phase three, which is what eventually gets you approved. Sometimes there's delays there. Uh, you know, there's a lot of waiting, there's a lot of waiting um, in, in, in the space. And, you know, as Bobby was saying, you know, could, could the prices be reduced if, if we cut that time out? And yeah, definitely. And another thing that, that uh, we have to think about too is, you know, how long the patents last, you know, patents generally last about 20 years. Um, and, you know, every, every, every year it takes to, uh, to develop something after you put in the patent is, is a year of protection that you don't get. Um, so, you know, that's another consideration as well. Yeah, John, one other question. Um, I'm kind of familiar with personalized medicine. 
Mm. Is that something that you're seeing more attention toward in in the in the biological uh, drugs? Yeah. Space? Yeah. 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 Well, with with genetic sequencing and with you know AI, as you talked about, AI is leveraging that personalized information. That's that's the benefit you can get from AI is is finding that that population, that subpopulation, which really shows uh, a benefit to this drug. So. Yes, that's that's extremely important, and that's the direction we're going. You know, you're seeing, um, you know, I talk about oncology, for example, checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, a lot of times, they're combined with other drugs, and depending on your genetic profile, you may want to combine it with, you know, this one or that one. And there's there's so many genetic uh, differences there. But you know, there have been several uh, MNAs last year. I think I did some work on this that were very focused on, on that. And also some, some, um, some IPOs as well, where they're focused on a genetic uh, subtype uh, for what they're doing, you know, for personalized medicine. Very good. Sorry, Steven, I thought, I thought I saw your, uh, you come off mute for a second with the comment. Uh, no, you know, I had something kind of earlier, but uh, just kind of listening uh, and uh, <laughs> observing here over the experts. Well, I think I think to kind of close out because we're kind of getting there. You know, Steve, I'll, I'll throw this one to you, Stephen. You know, being a generalist, you know, not necessarily looking specifically at healthcare. I mean, what are some of the hurdles for you that would maybe get you more comfortable to consider some of these biotech and healthcare investments? Yeah, and you're trying to control the variables, I think. And so, you know, when you have a company uh, out there that I'm analyzing, that the variables are measurable between kind of a certain range. And that allows for some predictability for me, at least within a range over the next several years. You know, we're not talking about kind of binary events in the next three months or six months or a year or something like that. I want to be able to predict cash flow uh, within a range five years out. And maybe the cash flow is the is the end game and there's 25, 100, 1,000 variables that go into that. And so I would typically prefer companies that have fewer variables, more measurable variables that then can can give some sort of prediction, right? About what that cash flow is going to be five years from now. You discount that back today. You you know, you figure out some sort of uh, market sentiment, you know, which ultimately translates into a multiple or something like that. Uh, but I think that's possible here. And I have, you know, invested in a few um a few companies that are uh, adjacent, I'd say, to this discussion. And heck, I was in Valiant in the beginning as well, not at the end, but in the beginning, uh, it, it actually was a company that was doing some, uh, taking a bit of an innovative approach. Obviously, it went haywire, you know, after a couple of years, but, uh, but the, the specific idea in the beginning of uh, acquiring these, um, let's say, sub-market brands and companies and bringing them on to the platform uh, and, you know, basically getting them into shelf space. Uh, you know, I remember Michael Pearson traveling to Poland, you know, to Czech Republic and things like that and buying these small brands there in order to get them on the Valiant distribution platform. And, you know, that that's something that was a bit predictable. It was uh, actually a nice strategy and it was something that, you know, this kind of roll up idea uh, was something investable until it wasn't, right? And then there's a limit because they get so big that nothing moves the needle anymore. And then they have to start, uh, I don't want to call it fraud, but they have to start going fraud adjacent, at least doing unethical things. But the idea in the beginning was something that was investable. Uh, you know, so for me, uh, gosh, I'm not going to hang my head, sounds terrible, hang my head on Valiant as the most investable company in the space here. Uh, but but you know, going back to what I what I mentioned, you want some predictability there. I think John and his expertise uh, can can get some of the predictability that I might not be able to get in some areas. Uh, but there are, you know, if they, like, I talked about Stericycle, like you know, there's other kind of pick and shovel companies that I think would be interesting. Maybe even uh, some of the uh, some of the healthcare. Uh, whether not healthcare, but you know, whether it's CVS, Walgreens that are giving the shots or you know, collecting a little bit of a copay for doing that, uh, that's a little bit more predictable for me because you know you can estimate the number of people who might show up, what that margin is, what the revenue is, et cetera, and uh, how that might contribute um, if there's more of a pure play there. So that's what I'm looking for, uh, and I would say that I think in this industry there's there's probably on average less less 
predictability, but it, there are pockets of predictability of uh, specific companies that I, in specific situations that I could be interested in. And, uh, I, and I think they would provide tremendous opportunities here of multi-bagger uh, kind of opportunities. Did you invest in Theranos? <laughs> I mean, I was afraid to even mention value. So, I mean, I deserve that. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I was on the board, but you know, I didn't notice anything. Everybody was on the board. <laughs> Untoward. They had a pretty good board, actually. Yeah, they had a great board. board. <laughs> yeah. Just wondering. to be clear, this is a complete joke here. It's a complete joke. Don't uh, I don't want any haters here saying uh, calling me an idiot on Twitter. Yeah, we do. We want to. Yeah, I think talking about governance and biotech and healthcare companies is a whole nother conversation onto itself. <laughs> yeah, but you know, to, to how, how some of these boards I are constructed. I had, yeah, I had to John though. Those are the questions that I w I would parse out to say, okay, what kind of predictability can I get from this? You know. Uh, sure. What is the total addressable? It's just like, you know, there's, there's comparables to the tech industry and things like that, where, you know, what's the total addressable market? What is the actual revenue potential here? What kind of margins do we think? Are there any comparables like the flu vaccine or something like that, that, you know, maybe they're a little bit comparable, but maybe not. What's the distribution system? And, you know, these types of questions are, are the things that, you know, I'm trying to then ballpark or range uh, that eventually will bring you and all those variables that eventually will bring you to some sort of free cash flow generation uh, at, at a certain time period. Very good. All right. Well, with that, I think we're about there. I mean, um, let, let's get some final thoughts on, uh, on just, you know, give any final thoughts, you know, it could be healthcare related or not, but uh, you know, um, I'm, I'm going to throw it to John, any kind of final thoughts and, and where can our audience go and find more information about you and follow you on social media? Sure. Um, you know, the final thoughts would be, you know, as, as Kevin was saying, you know, the, the, the binary outcome deters a lot of people from being interested in, in the space. Um, but I think that uh, if you have a portfolio of, 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 of companies that you can avoid some of that, or also just go big, you know, go to the guys who already have uh, products in place and, and they kind of make their money off of their commercialization skills and their, and their sales force that's, that's already in place. Um, so to find out more about uh, me and Zach, so you can go to Zach or scr.zax.com. That's small cap research, scr.zax.com. And I'm on Twitter at, at vanjohn10. Uh, that's it. Yeah, at vanjohn10. And thanks for having me here, you guys. Great to, great to speak with you and, and hear your thoughts, especially uh, Steve and all your detailed uh, um, uh, uh, on what you're looking for. That's really helpful. And his experience at Theranos, of course. Yeah, yeah. Oh, but, uh, <laughs> on the board. Again, I, I yeah, mean, I was board. A setup. Wasn't Kissinger on the board or somebody? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah Kissinger Batiste was on was. the board. Henry Schultz was on the board. Everybody. Oh, that's everybody right. Henry Schultz. On the board. <laughs> yeah. By the way, just to, for full disclosure, that that was a joke. Anyways, Kevin, final thoughts and where people can go and find final, more information. Final thought is something that came up on I think one of our first um, sessions in this lobby is the, the word uncertainty. Okay, and that's been bantered around quite a bit. And I would sit down and say it's it's probably the uncertainty related to uh, outcomes for these uh, clinical, preclinical, you know, drug companies that I think probably is the underlying reason why uh, I don't invest in them. So uncertainty again. I was going to say, I feel like each episode, the, the, the name of the episode should be uncertainty and then like the new fill theme. in the blank. Yeah. Yeah. Fill in the blank. Like that. The that's biotech that, files. <laughs> uncertainty. Yeah. The biotech the, files. <laughs> the uncertain, the, I'm going to call it the uncertainty round table, not the, the investors round table anymore. But, uh, and, and you can go and follow Kevin on Twitter at our favorite handle of all time at the good prick. Let's get him to 500. We're almost Just there. At a 500. Let's get him to 500. Anyway. Stephen, uh, final thoughts and where people can go and find more information on you. Yeah, thanks for having me here. It's great to, to be with you, uh, Bobby and Kevin again, and John, I've really enjoyed the conversation and your expertise mm -hmm. and knowledge. Uh, yeah, I can be found at uh, Stephen underscore Keel on uh, Twitter, uh, willowoakfunds.com, uh, which is uh, uh, the platform that we uh, provide uh, operational support to emerging managers. And then my fund is Arquitos. Uh, it's A-R-Q-U-I-T-O-S.com. Very good. Well, with that, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me today. I really do appreciate it for everybody that uh, may are tuning into the final 10 seconds. You can listen to every episode of the Investors Roundtable on the SNN Network YouTube channel at youtube.com slash SNNWire. And uh, again, thank you all for joining me. Look forward to the next one.
Take care. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.